Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome at uh, VU, welcome at our new campus here. We are extremely proud and happy uh, that uh, our university, VU, has moved to this wonderful uh, premises. For those of you who are here for the first time, uh, we have uh, moved here uh, just uh, two months ago. So September 3rd was the first uh, day in our offices. We are in the yellow-orange uh, building here at this uh, campus, building uh, D3. And uh, the official opening of the new campus uh, here in this building by the Austrian president uh, was October the 4th, so uh, just a little bit more than a month ago. And so everything here is uh, brand new. I really hope uh, you like the premises here. I can assure you that we are, as I've said before, very happy uh, to have this campus, that the Austrian taxpayer had been so generous uh, to uh, pay for this uh, wonderful uh, campus and that architects from all over the world, so this building was built by Zaha Hadid, uh, were involved here. So it's really a world-class uh, campus, at least this is our view on that. I hope you'll share it. And of course, uh, now the Austrian taxpayer expects uh, world-class uh, activities uh, from the whole university. And uh, this is uh, what we are going to try to do. And therefore, I'm also, uh, this is the direct link, I think, to, to, the, to today's event. Uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, the inaugural lecture of uh, Professor Eduardo uh, Traversa. Uh, we have the privilege that we have a world-class uh, researcher uh, with us for one year here in Vienna at VU at our campus. And this is something we would like to celebrate. This is something we would like to cherish. Uh, but uh, before, I, I'd like, uh, to, I will before I will turn over uh, to Professor <coughs> Traversa, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, invite uh, Mr. Pablo Hernandez <coughs> Gonzalez Pareda to come out here because we have something else to celebrate. Please, uh, Pablo, uh, <coughs> come out. Yeah, uh, we also would like uh, to, to use the occasion here, since so many international uh, scholars are with us uh, for this evening and also for the conference uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, uh, that uh, I would like to publicly uh, hand over the certificate of the uh, Tax Executive Institute Award. Uh, doing that already for the second time, so has already become a tradition uh, that together with the Tax Executive Institute, uh, our institute is sponsoring an award for uh, an excellent uh, publication in the area of uh, European tax. So over the summer, uh, Professor Pistone, who couldn't make it for uh, tonight uh, due to other commitments, and myself, together with other members of the jury, uh, we've spent a lot of time reading a lot of uh, articles, uh, very interesting articles, but there had been a lot of submissions for this award, excellent articles, and uh, we had to decide, was a difficult uh, decision uh, to make, which we found uh, was the best one. And uh, we uh, decided, uh, uh, with the, together with the other members of the jury, uh, that uh, the article written by uh, Pablo on the European way to a financial transaction tax under enhanced cooperation, multi-speed Europe or shortcut. Uh, that this article uh, was in our view the best of all the uh, submissions. Uh, I think it's a, a very interesting uh, topic. We all will find out whether it will become practical relevant. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen with the uh, financial transaction tax. But I think it's a perfect example uh, to analyze, uh, to examine how the concept of enhanced uh, cooperation uh, could and will work in tax, and we hope uh, if uh, not the financial transaction tax uh, will, uh, be, uh, will become the role model for that, then maybe uh, another tax in the future. So I think uh, what uh, your considerations, your deliberations will definitely uh, become uh, practically relevant uh, in the end. Uh, and uh, I think you have illustrated uh, that uh, you have excellent theoretical knowledge uh, and I think you brought forward also and uh, moved uh, uh, the uh, scholarship in, in the area 
uh, and academic work in the area of European uh, tax law. So I would all recommend you to read the article if you haven't done so. It's been published in uh, the Intertax and I would like to hand over now uh, the certificate on behalf of the Tax Executive Institute and uh, our institute here at VU. Congratulations, Pablo. Yeah, so this was already one of the highlights of uh, today's evening. Uh, the other highlight and main reason why people from very different countries have uh, come together tonight is uh, Eduardo, Professor Eduardo Traversa, <coughs> Professor at uh, the University of Louvain in Belgium. And uh, there is also a quite big Belgian fan club here, uh, which is uh, very much appreciated uh, by us. Uh, we are happy our university uh, for a year we may uh, share now, Eduardo, uh, with uh, the University of Louvain or maybe even more than share because you are mainly uh, with us now for uh, that year and uh, this is uh, really great for, the, for us, for our research staff, for our students because Eduardo is lecturing on European uh, tax law. He's, uh, uh, holding research uh, seminars here at our institute and uh, he is also uh, communicating uh, with our research staff discussing uh, their articles and helping us to improve our research and uh, the research area of our institute is very closely connected with Eduardo's uh, research uh, because uh, he's one of his, he has more than one area but one of his core research areas is European uh, tax law and uh, this is also a topic of uh, today's uh, lecture. Uh, I think we will hear a very interesting deliberations about uh, both the case law of the European Court of Justice, but also policy deliberations. And this fits perfectly in that uh, what we are going to achieve because our institute also uh, tries to combine uh, hardcore, to put it that way, legal issues uh, with uh, policy issues from an academic uh, point of view. And I think this is uh, at least what I expect uh, that we are uh, going uh, to hear uh, tonight. So please, Eduardo, the floor is yours. You're going to deliver your inaugural lecture right now. After that, uh, we'll have a discussion with uh, the professors, uh, with the other professors of our institute. Eduardo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the entire VU for this, uh, this invitation to spend one year, year here at the university and an invitation to work with one of the most prestigious, and if not the most prestigious, research center in the area of international and European taxation in the world. So, uh, sorry, where is it? Okay. So, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends, dear family, it's an honor and a pleasure to have been asked to address this inaugural lecture here at the VU in this beautiful and brand new campus, as Professor Lang reminded us. This new campus has something evocative, almost poetical, both for its bucolic location near the Prater and for its futuristic buildings. It invites to reflection. It calls our mind for endless journeys in the worlds of knowledge. In this sense, it offers us, at least from a scientific point of view, a permanent invitation to a journey. Invitation voyage, <coughs> in the words of the French poet Charles Baudelaire. As the poem said, là tout n'est cordre et beauté, luxe, calme et volupté, I translate, there all is order and beauty, luxury, peace and pleasure. A perfect description of the Institute of Tax Law, headed by Professor Lang. This new campus is a wonderful incentive to think and do research and thinking and teaching. 
an incentive, as Professor Lang recalled, generously granted to the Wirtschaft Universität by the Austrian taxpayers, and also not Austrian taxpayers paying Austrian taxes. In Europe, I'm sure that many universities do envy the Wirtschaft Universität and would like to receive a similar gift. Alas, within the European Union, education remains a purely domestic area of competence of member states. We could not therefore imagine a university from another member state claiming a similar favor from the Austrian state on the grounds of non-discrimination. This claim would certainly be considered as ill-founded, if not senseless. However, like I will try to show you, what appears senseless in a world without taxes may become sensible when it comes to taxation. The topic that I've chosen to address today is tax incentives and territoriality, reassessing the case law of the European Court of Justice in the light of the principles of federalism and sound tax policy. I'll deal with this topic in three steps. First, I shall define the concept of tax incentive in the light of the most recent political and academical debates. I'll then show how negatively tax incentives are generally seen, including in European Union law. In the second phase, I shall turn to the case law of the Court of Justice on tax incentives. I shall focus in particular on the cases concerning the compatibility of tax incentives adopted by member states with the fundamental freedoms of movement. And finally, in a third and last part, I shall critically assess the effects of this case law on the tax autonomy of the member states and on their, on their tax policy and suggest some refinements in the criteria that the European Court of Justice has used so far. The main function of taxes is to raise the revenue necessary to finance the missions and trust to public authorities, in accordance, <coughs> of course, with constitutional and supranational arrangements. But, as we all know, Taxes also serve other purposes. Tax legislators often adopt in the framework of their social, environmental, or economic policies preferential tax provisions. The effect of these provisions are to reduce the ordinary tax burden for certain activities or certain taxpayers only. Sometimes these provisions can be considered as alternative to direct government spending, or more convincingly, as subsidies. These preferential tax provisions are, ther are therefore referred to as tax expenditures, tax subsidies, or if we focused on the result that they intend to achieve, as tax incentives. Although these expressions do not exactly cover the same meaning, I shall never, nevertheless use them as synonyms for the purpose of my inaugural lecture. Since the middle of the 20th century, tax incentives have been subject to growing scrutiny and mistrust, and many authoritative voices have claimed for their repealing or at least their drastic limitation. Tax incentives are maybe bound to extinguish, as this beautiful animal, the dodo from Madagascar, which is extinct since the 17th century. <laughs> this mistrust against tax incentives is the result of three causes political transparency, academic research and constitutional and supranational accountability. Political transparency first. It's certainly the first reason. Under the influence of the United States, and in particular of Harvard law professor Stanley Surrey, 
who was an assistant secretary to the Treasury for tax policy in the 60s, and also who is known as the father of the concept of tax expenditures, national governments have started to identify and list the tax expenditures existing in their own tax systems. Tax expenditures have become an object of official publication, both at the domestic and international level. This, pra this practice has recently become an obligation within the European Union since a directive requires member states to publish detailed information on the impact of tax expenditures on revenue as for 2014. However, as this picture shows, uh, member many member states already complain, uh, complain, comply with this uh, standard of uh, good governance. Many member states already publish a list of the tax expenditures that they have in their own taxes, tax system. Following the initiatives improving the transparency of tax expenditure, academic literature in numerous empirical studies has contributed first to define, to better define the concept of tax incentive and then to evaluate their costs and their suitability to influence behavior. To give you an example of the wide variety of issues addressed by scholars, I can quote the definition of the reference benchmark to be used to characterize a tax expenditure as a departure from the ordinary tax system the method of calculation of the short-term and the long-term cost and benefit of tax incentives, the substitutability between tax incentives and direct spending, which proves empirically far less obvious than it had been assumed before, the effect of tax incentives on economic growth and firm location decision, as well as the use of tax incentives in environmental policies and, of course, many other topics. And if an improved transparency and a better knowledge have led to more effectively controlled tax incentive, and this both at the domestic and at the international level. In the domestic context, these measures may conflict with the constitutional principle of equality and other principles deriving from it, such as equality in taxation, ability to pay, or equality in competition, Wettbewerbsgleichheit. At the international level, several, several organizations monitor, review, and sometimes even call for the removal of certain tax incentives generally related to business and investment, because they are considered as harmful. This is, of course, the case for the European Union, with the control of state aid measures by the European Commission, as well as the Council initiatives in order to curb unfair or harmful tax competition. This is also the case of other international organizations, like the WTO, with the control of the subsidies under the GATT agreement, or the OECD, with the 1998 report on harmful tax com competition and quite recently, the report and the action plan on base erosion and profit shifting. It could have been expected that this combination of improved transparency, better knowledge, and stronger control of the tax incentive should have had as a consequence to restrain government to make a too extensive use of these measures. Experts, whether from academia or government, have indeed put in evidence several weaknesses inherent to these instruments. Critiques concern, in particular, the inadequacy of tax incentive to reach the goal they are assigned, their excessive costs, the fact that they may constitute hidden subsidies to certain economic actors, or that they distort international tax competition between states by being often used as in aggressive or substance-less tax planning strategies. This original mistrust 
against tax incentives was, in, was indeed at the base of Stanley Surrey's initiative to have the US Congress publishing a tax expenditure budget. Surrey hoped, by so doing, that it would induce the American Congress to abandon narrowly constructed tax incentives and replace them with better targeted spending programs. This mistrust against tax incentive has crossed the Atlantic, as is now particularly strong within the European Union. In this period of crisis and tight budget constraints, member states often, it has to be underlined, under the pressing recommendation of the European Commission, have undertaken several reform to limit the number and the effect of existing tax incentives. This is the case of Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and many others. But the most spectacular application of this anti-tax expenditure doctrine are to be found, unsurprisingly, in the member states that have been the object of the economic adjustment programs by the EU, the Eurozone, and the IMF, like Greece and Portugal. To give you an example, in Portugal, since 2005, three out of four tax incentives have disappeared. At the same time, however, member states, in order to ensure the sustainability of their public finance and of what we proudly and rightly call our, our European social model, have to adopt strategies to maintain growth, competitiveness, and a decent level of employment. In these strategies, tax policies play a very important role, along with educational, innovation, and labor market policies. And developing new growth-friendly tax policies almost necessarily implies the adoption of measures favoring certain behaviors, such as tax incentives. A quick empirical look at the use of tax expenditures by national governments show that despite experts and international organizations' recommendation, states continue to make a very extensive use of them. The leopard does not change his spots. To give some example, in 2010, the OECD listed as tax expenditures 86 measures in Germany, 100 in the Netherlands, 136 in Spain, and up to 381 measures in the United Kingdom. In Italy, a special committee established for this purpose listed in 2011 720 measures as tax incentive, a tax expenditure, for a total cost of 200 and 53 billion of euros. Tax incentive does exist in national uh, system, tax system, but they exist also in EU law, in particular in the VAT and the excess duty directives. Within non-harmonized areas, those measures are moreover expressly allowed at certain conditions by the Europe, European Commission under the state aid provisions. Assuming that for these reasons it is illusory and maybe counterproductive to dream about a world without tax incentives, it is essential to focus on their design. The primary step would consist in being aware of the existing limitation to these instruments. These limitations can be related to their economic efficiency, their political feasibility, or to their legal compatibility with the existing constitutional or international framework. In this lecture, I'll address only this latter aspect, focusing on the limit imposed by European Union law to the member states. Furthermore, I shall restrain my analysis to some provision included in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, the freedom of movement. The European Court of Justice 
has intervened in the European debate about tax incentives, and quite heavily. Apart from its role in reviewing European Commission's decision in the area of state aid, the Court has tested domestic tax incentive against the so-called fundamental freedoms. These freedoms guarantee the free movement of persons as well as the, as the different means of production, such as goods, services, and capital throughout the European Union and even beyond concerning the free movement of capital. The reason why the court came across tax incentive in its case law on the fundamental freedom is quite simple. Tax incentive are most of the time associated with conditions in order to target more adequately the objective pursued or simply to limit their <coughs> budgetary impact. These conditions can be of a quantitative nature, of a qualitative nature, of a temporal nature, but also of a territorial nature. Under territorial conditions, the benefit of the tax advantage is geographically limited, usually to the territory of the member states, but sometimes even to the territory of a region within a member state. These territorial tax incentive will be the main topic of my lecture. In the vast majority of cases, the court held these territorial restrictions to tax incentive incompatible with European law. The court, indeed, does not only interpret the fundamental freedoms as prohibiting difference in treatment between national and non-nationals, or between residents and non-residents. It also considers incompatible with the freedom of movement any unequal treatment of a cross-border situation in comparison with a domestic situation. Those restrictions are not admitted under European law unless an overriding reason in the public interest, as defined by the court, justifies such treatment. Broadly speaking, the incentives examined by the Court of Justice can be divided in two categories, business-related tax incentives and non-business-related or social tax incentives. Among business-related tax incentives, several cases decided by the Court concerned incentives for research and development. In this case, they were limited to the territory of some member states, like France or Spain. Other, dealt, other cases dealt with investment incentives and others in the incentive to the acquisition of share in resident company. In all these cases, there was a territorial condition which made the court decide that these incentives were contrary to the fundamental freedoms. Social tax incentives include preferential tax regime concerning social security and social protection in the broader meaning, namely pension and health care. Other cases deal with cultural and educational policy and charitable bodies. And a last series of case deals with housing policies, and in particular tax incentive for the acquisition of, the, of a first residence of, of, or the change uh, of residence. As I said, in all these cases, the court considered that territorial restriction were restriction to the fundamental freedoms and had to be justified. And in a very small proportion of these cases, the court accepted the justification put forward by the member states. Those justifications are listed here. The loss of revenue, which <coughs> is due to the extension of the incentive to cross-border situation. 
the need to safeguard the effectiveness of the fiscal supervision and the fight against tax fraud and abuse, the need for a connection between the recipient of the service and the society of the member states, was also invoked by, by some member states, the preservation of the allocation of powers between member states in the area of taxation, as well as the coherence of the tax system were the other justification. The loss of revenue has always been considered as an unacceptable justification by the court. Concerning the administrative difficulties that member states could face when trying to control the direct or indirect beneficiaries of these tax incentives in other member states, the court refused to consider the argument put forward by the member states, stating that national authorities could use existing European instruments of administrative cooperation or even ask the taxpayer to provide the necessary evidence. Moreover, according to the court, accepting such a justification would amount to presume fraud or evasion in case of situation involving member states, and only then. The court also rejected the, ar the arguments based on the need for a connection between the recipient of a benefit and the society of the member state concerned. According to the court, the effect of accepting this justification would be to indirectly recognize the justification based on the need to prevent the reduction of tax revenue. More surprisingly, in a quite recent Belgian case, the Argenta case decided on the 4th of July 2013, the court refused to admit that a member state could link a tax advantage to the effective taxation under the Belgian tax system. As far as the territoriality of tax incentives is concerned, the only ground of justification accepted by the court so far is the need to preserve the coherence of the tax system, but with a very narrow interpretation. It is defined as a direct link established between the tax advantage concerned and the offsetting of that advantage by a particular tax levy. The court accepted this justification in 1992 in a case about the deductibility about, uh, of insurance and pension contribution, the famous Bachmann and Commission versus Belgium case, and more recently, in the context of housing policy, in two decisions of December 2011, Commission versus Belgium and Commission versus Hungary. The court accepted in those cases that member states could grant a tax rebate for the purchase of residential property under the condition that the purchaser had already owned his previous residence on the territory of the member state concerned, excluding thus owners of dwellings located in other member states. This case law of the court and its consequences on the tax autonomy of the member states has raised serious criticism among, among policymakers and commentators. American professors Michael Gratz and Olvin Warren pointed in 2006 that the court's decisions also threatens the ability of member states to use tax incentives to stimulate their economies. Professor and fellow Belgian colleague Luc de Brou, in a comment to the Argenta case of 2013, said that this judgment may cause a headache to tax legislators in member states who wish to limit the scope of tax incentives to profit which come within the purview of their tax jurisdiction. I also share these concerns. 
I think that this case law, in its present states, can be criticized under three distinct lines of arguments. The first, based on tax policy implications. The second, based on the legal, almost constitutional, principle governing, <coughs> governing the allocation of powers between the European Union and its member states, which I refer to as the principle of federalism. While the third is inspired by a consideration based on political philosophy. From a tax policy perspective, first, there is a fundamental incoherence resulting from the interpretation of the EU freedoms. Under the present case law, member states are required to apply tax incentives to non residents for activities carried out on their territory and at the same time to extend the scope of those incentives to activities carried out by residents outside their territory on the territory of other member states. Two fictive examples can help to illustrate these inconsistencies. The first example concerns tax incentives in favor of investment and it's largely inspired from the Argenta case. Let's assume that a member state under a rescue plan, Greece, wants to adopt an incentive to stimulate its economy and get out of the very pressing control of the Troika institutions. Logically, in line with these objectives, this country should try to make these tax incentives attractive to companies that invest within the country. By applying the Argenta case law, it appears rather unlikely that this member state could, under the fundamental freedom, impose any requirement of a minimum activity on the national territory. Therefore, it would have to grant the incentive to investment made in other member states. Under this constellation, Greece would have to fund with its own budget, budget the branches of Greek companies investing in Germany, and this for the exclusive benefit, from a tax revenue perspective, of this latter member state. Since, according to double taxation conventions, Greece would not be in, posi in a position to tax the profit arising from these branches. From the taxpayer viewpoint, cross-border activity would not only be put on a needful footing, but clearly favor favored in respect of domestic activities. The taxpayer would indeed be able to benefit from tax incentive provided by two member states, its state of origin and its state of activity, while being taxed on the profits only once. Is that a desirable result? Should Greece spend public money on the funding of economic activity in Germany without getting any return? Should the taxpayer get a double benefit when investing cross-border? Or does it simply imply that those countries should refrain from adopting such tax incentives, leaving these possibilities, <coughs> which would become almost a privilege, only to the member state with enough financial resources to fund pan-European tax subsidies on their own national budget. The second example concerns tax incentives in the area of environmental policy. As you see, I couldn't not speak about Belgium. One of the symbols of Belgium is our it's quite ironic, like the French fries. So let's assume that Belgium, in its environmental policy, wishes to give a tax incentive for the acquisition of solar panels by individuals. It's perfectly legal, and it is also in line with a sound environmental policy. By contrast, the neighboring member states, the Netherlands, 
also wants to adopt a tax incentive in the area of environmental protection. In the Netherlands, one of the specialities are, is the cheese, but also windmills. So you could imagine that the Netherlands would go for wind energy. And so promoting the use of uh, wind turbines. If, those, if these member states want their tax incentive to comply with the fundamental freedoms at their, as they are currently interpreted by the court, they should ensure that their incentive are available to non-residents owning immovable property on their territory, as well as to residents in relation to investment made in other member states. The obligation on the member states to grant incentives to non-residents making green investment on their territory does not raise any particular policy question. Indeed, it would be clearly discriminatory to deny the tax advantage to non-residents who adopt the behavior encouraged by the state <coughs> on whose territory they make the investment on the sole ground, ground that they are <coughs> resident in another member state. However, forcing member states to grant incentives to investment realized outside their territories does not appear reasonable, unless you want French fries only to, also to become uh, a speciality in the Netherlands. Because it not only creates the risk of a significant loss of revenues, but moreover, the obligation to extend tax incentive to cross-border situation leads to spillover effects and a serious encroachment on the policy choices made by other member states. In this example, Belgium would be forced, in order to apply its own national environmental program, to fund the installation of solar panel on dwelling located in the Netherlands, which is a country that has chosen to favor wind energy and not solar energy. The practical consequences of that would certainly not be in line with what we could call sound tax policy. Because as you can see, in my example, all, both country would have to fund both <coughs> type of uh, environmentally friendly energy and that would create this uh, spillover effect and uh, inefficiency in the policies carried on by mo both member states. Moreover, the solution would have been different if member states would have preferred to grant not a tax subsidy, but a normal subsidy, a direct subsidy. It seems, therefore, that the case law of the Court of Justice implicitly contain a bias in favor of direct subsidy and against tax incentives. While, and that's the most important thing, the political choice between these two policy instruments should be left to the member states. Secondly, this case law leads to inconsistent results also when analyzed in the light of the principle of federalism, which aim at ensuring a fair and efficient allocation of powers between the member states and the European Union. According to the treaty, certain competencies have been entirely, entirely transferred to the European level. Others are shared between the European Union and the member states, while the rest of the competence, according to the principle of conferral, have remained within the exclusive jurisdiction of the member states. Fundamental freedoms have to be interpreted in accordance with this system of division of powers. Tax incentives raise specific issues in this respect, since they pursue goals that are linked to non-tax competences such as 
as we've seen before, education, health, social policy, employment, research and development, economy and business, and even land use planning and housing policies. These non-tax competencies have different impacts on the achievement of the internal market and on the other goals assigned to the European integration. For example, the distorting effects of tax incentives in the area of research and development cannot be compared to measures applicable in the residential housing sector. I'm not pleading for a complete overturn of the principle governing the division of taxing powers between the EU and the Member States. Tax incentives are tax measures and as such must follow the allocating principles in the area of taxation and not of the other areas, even if they can be used as an instrument to support the Member States in the fulfilment of their duties under their exclusive competencies. I nevertheless advocate for a refinement in the interpretation of the fundamental freedoms. As it's written, why endorse an interpretation of the fundamental freedom that would lead as a result that member states are excessively hindered in the exercise of their exclusive competencies, according to the European Treaty, if there is an alternative interpretation that allows for a more harmonious <laughs> exercise of the powers between both levels of government. Such a concern can be found in the constitutional tradition of some member states, like Belgium, when having to assess whether a rule adopted by a level of government does not encroach too much into the power conferred to other level of government, the Belgian Constitutional Court applies its, applies its own definition of the principle of proportionality. According to this principle, a level of government making use of its taxing or non-taxing powers must ensure that the measure it adopts do not encroach too far upon the other government's constitutional responsibilities in tax or non-tax areas. Application, for example, can be found in the area of environmental protection, where the region have the regulatory powers, while most environmental taxes are adopted by the federal states. I think that this case law of the Belgian Constitutional Court as well as a renewed approach of the notion of territoriality, could inspire the European Court of Justice in refining its case law on tax incentives. The concept of territoriality, which is also one of the founding principles of federalism, could be of great help in achieving a better balance in the division of powers between member states themselves and between the member states and the European Union. Indeed, the, the principle of territoriality as the recognition of the territorial limits of the member states' tax and non-tax policies could be used in order to determine which state have to grant the tax, tax advantage and which state are entitled to <coughs> deny it. Thirdly, forcing, forcing member states to expand the scope of tax incentive to situations that fall outside their territorial jurisdiction <coughs> contradicts the theory of the justification for taxation developed by the late Klaus Vogel. Dr. Honoris Causa of this university, and certainly one of the most prolific and inspiring tax lawyers of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. In his article, the justification for taxation, a forgotten question, Fogel criticizes the two classical theories for justifying taxation, the benefit theory and the sacrifice or social contract theory. Under the benefit theory, taxes are the price paid by each individual in compensation for the public services 
provided by the state to him or her individually. Under the sacrifice or social contract theory, taxes are based on the assumption that each individual should contribute to the commonwealth according to his capacities or ability to pay. Denouncing the inadequacy of this theory, Klaus Vogel proposes instead to justify taxation on the basis of the principle of reproductivity inspired by Lawrence von Stein. According to this principle, the state is entitled to a share of the benefits he contributed to create through spending measures. Applying per analogy Vogel's and von Stein theory to the issue of tax incentives, it appears rather sound that a member state should be entitled to benefit from the positive effect of the activities he contributed to foster through the adoption of a tax incentive. I'm nearing now the end of my lecture, and it's time to make <coughs> concrete proposals. First, I think that the court should adopt a slightly different approach for business-related or income-related tax incentives and for social tax incentive, thus making a distinction between the two. This distinction has a particular relevance in the European context for at least two reasons. On the one hand, business-related tax incentives fall within the scope of state aid provision, while social tax incentives do not, most of the time. On the other hand, Business-related tax incentives are clearly connected with the achievement of the internal market, an area where member states have entrusted the e European Union with large powers. Social tax incentives, on the other hand, generally concern areas such as social policy, education and culture, which remain under the exclusive competence of the member states with very few powers given to the European Union. Concerning business tax incentives, the court should consider that member states cannot, in principle, subject their application to territorial condition with one exception. Contrary to its approach in the Argenta case, the court ought to recognize the coherence of the member states' choice to grant a tax advantage only in respect to activities directly or indirectly connect to the generation of income effectively taxable and thus not exempt under the domestic legislation. This is logical and not detrimental to the achievement of the internal market. The exemption from taxation should be seen as an advantage per se and be seen as an alternative to the situation of being subject to tax and being granted, but being granted, a tax incentive. With regards to non-business related tax incentives, or social tax incentives, as I call them, the court should assess the proportionality of the territorial limitation with respect to the goal pursued by the measure and take into account two considerations. First, the court should examine whether territoriality is necessary for the member state to implement its policy. It should previously analyze whether this policy, this measure, concern an area of exclusive competence of the member states which has little impact on the objective of the European Union. Second, the court should take into account the spillover effect of an extension of the scope of this tax incentive to situations in other member states. Such a proportionality text would not be completely new in the European landscape. A similar approach is to be found, for example, in the practice of the European Commission concerning aid to cultural <coughs> development. In a very recent communication of the 14th of November 2013, 
the Commission confirmed an earlier position of 2001 that Member States are allowed to grant tax incentives to film production under the condition to spend the biggest part of the film budget on the territory of the Member State concerned. Such a two-pronged approach would not jeopardize the effectiveness of the internal market and of the fundamental freedoms, but would ensure <coughs> Member States proper room for maneuver in designing tax incentives. Of course, this is a second best option, which should probably not be necessary in a European Union with common economic and social policies, as well as pan-European solidarity mechanism funded through an adequate EU budget. But this is the topic for another lecture. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring lecture, uh, which will be followed now by a panel uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, everybody on the panel is invited uh, to uh, make a comment uh, respect of Eduardo's uh, lecture. And then Eduardo will have the last word and also the opportunity to, to respond uh, to the ideas uh, which uh, will have been articulated here on the panel. And the panel consists to my uh, left of Fritz Rödler, who is a close friend and supporter of our institute, has been for many, many years in the meantime. He used to be a PwC partner here in Vienna and is uh, now a chairman of the supervisory board of Erste Bank. Uh, which is not only in this country, but also in uh, some other sea countries, uh, one of the uh, main uh, players in the financial area. Uh, then, on the far left, uh, from my side, Alfred Storck, one of the professors of our institute. To my right, Josef Schuch and uh, Klaus Stadinger. Uh, two of the professors couldn't make it uh, today. I mentioned already Professor Pistone is busy in Italy uh, today, and Professor Owens, who was here yesterday, is already on his way to Brazil, where he's representing our institute at the conference there. So uh, in the meantime, we are in the privileged situation that we have so many professors that's almost impossible that all of them are at the same time in one uh, place. Yeah, uh, having introduced the panel, I'd uh, invite my fellow uh, panel members uh, to start making their comments. Who would like to start? Fritz? Well, just uh, a short comment. I, I fully agree with uh, the conclusion that, uh, of course, uh, this is the second best solution. It's the second best solution because, of course, we do not have a coordinated tax system in Europe, and this is the effect that we are now seeing with regard to tax incentives. And also, because I believe the tax incentives should be used very restrictively. Um, taxation has its main purpose to generate revenue, and only in very exceptional cases should the government interfere and try to uh, influence the behavior of its citizens. And I think uh, Unfortunately, tax incentives are being used much too extensively in modern tax systems. And uh, I was very impressed by this list of, uh, of tax incentives that uh, uh, Eduardo uh, read to us. It almost reads like the Leporello area of, of Don Giovanni, you know, with uh, um, uh, a, a, lot of <laughs> um, a lot of incentives, which I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, are not um, reaching their target. Whenever a government introduces an incentive, um, there are, of course, many people who are using that incentive without actually the government um, aiming uh, this incentive at them. And uh, if we now look at the, the discussion that we have on the international level about base zero ocean profit shifting, etc., 
On the one side, of course, this is due to uh, discrepancies in this uh, disconnect in tax system, but it's also uh, due to the fact that many countries introduce these types of incentives just to attract, not just to stimulate certain activities, but just to attract the tax base. Um, and what is an incentive, maybe a useful incentive for one country, is a tax loophole uh, in the view of the other countries. So, uh, I think um, one of the goals of tax policy should really be to reduce the number of tax incentives to the absolute minimum. And the economists tell us all the time uh, the most effective tax system is the one which does not influence the behavior of taxpayers before and after tax. So these are the, the comments I just wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned uh, base erosion and profit shifting, and I think uh, this is also uh, a topic uh, maybe Alfred would like to refer to. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I also would like to make a brief comment and not getting too much details. Uh, I, in principle, do agree to Professor Traversa's statement that it is illusory, as he said, and may be counterproductive to dream about a world of without tax incentive. So I do believe we have to live with that incentive concept uh, for the years to come. But I fully support his conclusion that it is essential to focus on such uh, incentive, and as uh, Fritz Rödler said, to limit those incentives. I also do share, uh, and that is probably a question uh, of, of a debate, uh, Professor uh, Traversa proposal that the European Court should adopt a slightly different approach to business-related tax incentive versus the social, as he called, tax incentive. <coughs> as business-related uh, tax incentive fall within the scope of the state aid provision, while obviously social incentives do not. And I would like to focus, beside BAPS, on the example of the license and patent boxes I call that simply the IP boxes as a very modern tax incentive and one of the key incentives for so-called mobile business <coughs> activities. While the setup of such IP boxes appears justified by the former Lisbon strategy and now Europe 2020 strategy, the incentive or the incentive to, to incentivize IND activities and to support growth in the European region, the current implementation of such boxes raises a number of concerns as it varies uh, in many aspects. And I would like to just raise three topics. The existence of both IND deductions, IND tax credits, and IP boxes. We have examples for both incentives in a certain country like Belgium, France, the Netherlands, and Spain. We have examples for IP boxes only in one country, such as Luxembourg. The next topic is the scope of IP boxes, what is in the box and what is outside the box. Whether patents only are covered or also, as now the UK has pushed for so-called embedded intangibles, meaning business which qualifying intangibles, which is a very broad scope, even if it looks in the first, first glance very limited. To what extent local activities are required in order to get such an intentive incentive? What is the so-called activity test? Is he a territorial test? Or is that a test of management and control and the business could be done elsewhere in the world? How the tax privilege income should be calculated? Should that be done in a basket model? Or do we apply now high sophisticated uh, uh, tax planning uh, uh, theories on residual profit split. And finally, what is the rate? Are we talking about 2.5%, 5% or 10%? Uh, coming uh, to my, my conclusion, in my opinion, and I think hopefully in line with Professor Tavertas' proposal, such an important incentive as an IP box should be designed in a similar manner, alone as an input credit, or together with input credit also as an output credit. But we should have clear limits for the tax rate, and we should have similar requirements for the activity test. Should it be local or should it be global?
We should also have clear rules for what is the profit to be uh, privileged under such rules, under the IBPOX concept. And a summary, only by harmonizing this concept, I do believe we have uh, what I can fulfill the requirements of the ECJ on justification and proportionality. And I do believe the threshold which will come now in the BAPS project uh, can be met. So far to my short uh, conclusion on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Alfred. Josef? Yeah, maybe <clears throat> starting with a, with a national remark. Uh, very recently we had federal elections and in the campaign the then reigning Minister of Finance came up with the number of 582 incentives, tax incentives, obviously uh, in place in the Austrian tax code. And uh, when I heard that number, I thought that the gold medal would go to Austria, but uh, I was educated uh, by Eduardo that our Italian friends, at least our Italian friends, beat us uh, in that uh, respect uh, with a number of uh, 720. Now, uh, more in substance and uh, jumping to one of your uh, conclusions, Eduardo, um, I think one of them was um, that you should take into account uh, income exempt in a territorial manner if you look at a taxpayer and this taxpayer has domestic source income and forest source income and foreign source income would be exempt, be it by means of a domestic exemption or be it by means of a treaty-based exemption, then you would allow um, the uh, jurisdiction to apply an incentive effectively on that pot which remains after uh, taking it into account exempt foreign source income. So um, basically, then you would build a uh, connection uh, and uh, follow, strictly follow, more or less, in a kind of backpack approach, um, the non-exempt remaining taxable income. And there you could apply any incentive as opposed to foreign source exempt income where you could not uh, apply an incentive. My question in that context would be, now if you compare the mechanics and the effect of an exemption of foreign source income uh, with uh, the credit method, um, obviously if you give full credit, then this translates into an exemption. Uh, and my question would be in that context whether you would also go uh, that far and basically apply the same concept and say, okay, in a situation where you would not exempt foreign source income, but technically achieve the same effect, but technically by means of giving a credit, you would also um, apply uh, your logic. And uh, second question, uh, looking at your second uh, uh, suggestion to make, to draw a line between more business-related incentives as opposed to more private or social family uh, related uh, incentives. Um, just a, uh, I, I understand this is work in progress because also the, our German neighbors had elections and I understand when reading newspapers that one, um, one uh, point of discussion is uh, the road tax. And uh, if I get the point, the suggestion goes that uh, there should be a road tax throughout Germany, but Germany would give German taxpayers effectively a credit uh, option, so German car owners could credit their road tax fully credit against their car tax, as opposed to non-German uh, uh, car owners who obviously uh, would not have any capacity, any German car tax capacity to credit the German road tax against uh, so that effectively um, non-German car owners would be left with the full hit of the potential future German road tax. In that context, I was wondering, let's suppose there is a private individual car driver 
non-German car driver, and there is a, I don't know, a, 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 a lorry driver who drives the German roads for business purposes. Um, how would that concept of uh, drawing a line between business-related and more social-related incentives uh, work? But that is a less serious question than the exemption as a post-credit one. Thank you. Thank you. Klaus? Thank you. Um, so, fir first of all, uh, thank you, Eduardo, for your lecture. Welcome again here at VU. Uh, I always knew that we liked it very much to have you with us for a year, but today um, I, I liked it even more. Because, so we Austrians typically underestimate what we have and we learn from you what we have here at this campus and I can only repeat it, there is order, beauty, luxury, peace, pleasure. <laughs> so continue, I'm, I'm sure if they were not extinct centuries ago we would also have those dodo birds here. Mm -hmm. um, it, what we have indeed here is a certain history dealing with the issues of the case law of the European a court of justice, and actually this is the uh, first part of a two-day conference on, 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 on the topic. And I went back to the um, I went back to uh, to the books published after previous conferences, and there were actually uh, two Austrian cases dealing with exactly the kind of issues that you were that you were presenting: tax incentives uh, of a territorial nature, um, and are they um, in line with European fund fundamental freedoms? Both were not. Uh, um, and I had the honor to present those two cases um, at, at the conferences, and I took the opportunity to read again the rulings of the court um, on those cases, and in particular one of those cases, that's uh, Commission versus Austria, um, uh, case number 10 from 2010, I think is very interesting here, because this was on the deduction of um, uh, gifts or donations to universities, and they were only deductible if given to Austria. We like that rule very much. Um, um, it, it, this, it, this case was from the beginning a lost case for Austria because the, 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 the rule was very obviously disc discriminating non-Austrian uh, universities or donations given to non-Austrian universities because the place of establishment of the university was essentially the only uh, uh, criterion for uh, the gift being deductible or, or, or not. But nonetheless, it's quite interesting to read the justifications that the Austrian government came up with um, and the way the court, uh, the way the court uh, dealt with those um, proposals for justification. And my, my conclusion, be, be, I will start with my conclusion before I give you the details on it. I think the court, if, 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 if read in the right way, is already half following you. <coughs> In, in a sense, so there would be room for a more balanced interpretation of the acceptance of territorial restrictions um, of, of tax incentives. When you, when, you read, when you read the ruling, it's quite fascinating. First, first uh, um, try of the Austrian government to, ju uh, to ju uh, justify uh, that university gift rule was that it should promote research and development uh, in Austria. The court rejected that argument for the very simple reason because the, the court read the European treaties and found there a quite general and fun, but fundamental statement. It is the purpose of the European Union um, uh, to get rid of uh, fiscal or tax obstacles of research and development in the, in, in the internal market. And, and, and therefore the argument could simply not work uh, to uh, promote through a tax measure, Austrian or Austrian exercise or Austrian effective research and development. But at the same time, there was a second argument brought forward, and that was that um, the, uh, the, 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 the limitation of the benefit to Austrian universities should promote uh, national education and training. And indeed, we do have here a, 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 an, educa an educational function here. And quite interesting that the court, the, the court made clear that this could be, it could be a reason of overriding interest that could justify the territorial restriction of such tax measure. The problem in this case was that it was, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the rule was still uh, not proportional because it was a, bluntly, a blunt discrimination of non-Austrian 
um, institutions, even if they, in their, in their actual activities, would do something in favor of, um, uh, of educating Austrian people, or, or, or to the contrary, if an Austrian university would only teach non-Austrian students, it, 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 it would be a good university for, in terms of that rule. And, and anyway, but, but I think the, the, the key lesson to learn from that case is there could be, if, if read carefully, there could be room, in even more room than traditionally thought of, more room for, justi for justification of such tax measure. Therefore, I think, I, I think that your lecture could give um, future case law that kind of needed extra push into that direction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if I may add maybe uh, two additional ideas before I hand over to Eduardo so that he has the uh, final uh, word. Uh, I'd, I'd like to come back to the beginning of uh, uh, Eduardo's uh, lecture when Eduardo pointed out uh, what the so-called legal basis uh, for, uh, for uh, or what, what type of rules uh, we have which deal with uh, all the different types of incentives. And Eduardo, of course, mentioned uh, the freedoms, uh, mentioned the state aid rules, uh, but also uh, OECD, Code of Conduct, European Code of Conduct, Harmful Tax uh, um, uh, Code uh, by the OECD. And I think it's extremely important, and I'm very grateful that you pointed out these different types of rules, because I think we should also put some emphasis on the different types of rules. And I have to admit, I feel, uh, as a lawyer, I feel much more comfortable as long as we deal with hard law uh, when we deal with uh, state aid rules, when we deal with freedoms, uh, where we have at least uh, the European Court of Justice as, as the end, as the sole arbiter uh, to decide on the interpretation of these rules, uh, which has legitimation under the uh, European law, compared to a soft law, where it's uh, more or less, uh, where we are working with gentlemen's agreements, where we are working uh, with uh, uh, pressure, and I think we all see the developments in different areas at the level of the OECD. And uh, I think from a lawyer's point of view, it's not really a satisfactory uh, what's uh, happening here and how, in particular, also uh, smaller countries, and we are here in a smaller country, and your home country is a smaller country, how smaller countries uh, come under uh, pressure here. So this is uh, one uh, point I would uh, put additional emphasis, and I'm very grateful that you've mentioned uh, that already. Second, completely different issue in respect of European law, and I try to be a bit uh, provocative also, uh, because I think uh, what uh, what uh, you, Eduardo, have explained to us was uh, very convincing. There is maybe a bit room. Klaus has uh, uh, articulated uh, some ideas under the existing uh, case law of the European Court of Justice for the domestic legislature to develop further uh, tax policy in the area of incentive, but there is not much room. Uh, and uh, I think this analysis we heard was, uh, was very convincing. But if I distinguish now between uh, state aid rules and the freedoms, on the other hand, uh, <coughs> if we identify that a certain incentive uh, constitutes a state aid, well, we all know that this is not necessarily the end of the story and that uh, the measure as such is forbidden. The only uh, consequence is that we have to ask uh, approval from the uh, European uh, Commission. So therefore, what uh, the European law provides uh, and tells us uh, that uh, for some economic uh, measures, for uh, important economic policy measures, uh, the power has uh, shifted uh, to the European level. And I think in the, in the area of the freedoms, uh, I think the result, maybe the, uh, the reasoning is different, but the result, I think, is... Uh, is quite similar because uh, the European Court of Justice has, in my view, quite convincingly uh, pointed out uh, that uh, there is not much room for the domestic legislator uh, to uh, implement uh, and to grant incentives on a domestic level because, uh, as you have uh, explained under the existing uh, case law, well, uh, you would have uh, to uh, 
extend it uh, to other countries, maybe even uh, to the world as such. Um, so therefore, uh, it doesn't make sense if the <coughs> domestic le legislator introduces such measures. But isn't the message uh, the one we get that uh, there is still room for tax law for domestic, uh, for the member states, uh, but only insofar as uh, the collection of taxes is concerned? But as far as uh, we are coming to economic policy, and of course I admit, uh, I'm the first to admit uh, that it's uh, quite difficult to draw the borderline, uh, but in general, as a rule, as far as uh, its uh, economic policy is concerned, uh, then I think if the member states want to use taxation as a means, as a tool for economic policy, well, uh, then they have uh, to uh, shift uh, competence to the European level. So the message, in my view, is more or less uh, clear. Uh, you can only use taxation as a tool for economic policy if you harmonize or if you uh, shift power uh, to the European level. And from a policy point of view, well, is that completely bad? Hope I was a bit provocative no. and now uh, it's Eduardo's turn. Thank you. So I'll try to answer all the questions, but I, I cannot guarantee that I'll uh, be able to give a substantial answer to all your queries. Um, first, um, uh, about uh, the fact that tax incentives should be used restrictively. Um, I, I could agree. I think the major question here is who has to decide uh, if tax incentives have to be used broadly or restrictively. Is it at the European level or the national level? Uh, at the moment, I think that it should be more, even if I'm a convinced a European, and I, I share the fact that they should be harmonized, but at the moment, I think that this decision has to be taken by, by, by the member states with the European limitations, but not, um, as we can see now, we have the impression that the decision has already been taken by the European level that tax incentives shouldn't be adopted because, for example, uh, forcing a worldwide application of tax incentive is the best way uh, to, to, to prohibit from a factual point of view, to prohibit the application of this incentive. And um, the second uh, aspect of this, uh, this, this um, uh, discussion is not only the level of uh, the, the level of government that should take the decision to adopt tax incentive or not, but the body. Uh, is it for a court to di directly or indirectly decide by interpreting the fundamental freedoms that member states should or should not adopt tax incentive. I think that's, that's the, the, the most disturbing um, uh, problem at the moment. Uh, concerning uh, patent boxes, this is a good example of the fact that uh, member states uh, do not give up their willingness to adopt tax incentive, but uh, as, I, as I said, the uh, leopard can change his spots. They simply find new ways to adopt sense incentive. So they carefully study the limit and they try to um, basically break the spirit of the law without breaking the words. Uh, and they're doing that, in my, in my opinion, with patent boxes because basically saying that uh, you won't pay, you will pay uh, uh, five, six percent, uh, it's seven percent tax on the income from, from a patent in Belgium while the ordinary tax rate for corporate tax is uh, 34, I call that a, a, a state aid. So it could be justified, but it's certainly not as it is called in a typical uh, European EU state aid vocabulary, a general measure. But, but um, uh, member states have, have learned how to adapt, and that's why we're stuck now with these new, new measures, which are in fact state aid, but are not according to the, the traditional uh, um, the, the traditional vocabulary, a traditional approach. So that's why I, I think uh, these measures should be harmonized. And there is a very good argument to harmonize also uh, patent boxes is the fact that patent boxes at the national level are effective, at least within Europe, only thanks to a European directive. There is an interest in royalty directive uh, forcing member states to apply a, a zero uh, percent withholding tax 
on, um, on uh, interest and royalty. Without this directive, patent boxes have almost no reasons to exist. So that's because of this already uh, important implication of the European legislator in this area, should be uh, room for harmonizing tax incentive. It exists also at, for example, at the Swiss uh, federal level. There is a harmonization of uh, uh, income tax. Some, some provision and some tax incentive are harmonized. So I'm fully in favor of having a limited harmonization of certain tax incentive. Um, um, to answer Josef Schuch, um, I think, and that's the most disturbing thing about the, the Argenta case, is that um, the, the Belgian legislator already complied with the, with the judgment, but in a purely formal way. So basically, uh, and this is not uh, the Leopard, but the Gepard, a famous uh, 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 book uh, from Tomasi di Lampedusa, an Italian book where the, the old count of Lampedusa says uh, to make things continue as they are, they have, we have to change everything. So basically, if we change everything, everything has remained the same. And that's what the Belgian legislature did. So basically, they changed the legislation to ensure that they would get exactly the same result with the new legislation as with, it, with the old one, simply trying to pretend that they uh, fully complied with the, with the ECJ. How? By simply changing the design. And that's always the same problem. If you change the appearance of the, of the rule by changing the wording, but the result is the same, how should the court react? Uh, under the non-discrimination approach and the traditional approach, I think that if you simply grant the tax incentive, but then for a part of the income, and then you exempt the income, it's not a problem. But it seems, it, it seems problematic, because basically you're doing the same as before, but simply in a different way. So, um, it shows also maybe that this approach of the court has some, some limits. Um, and as for the road tax in Germany, um, there were analogous discussion at the, the, the Belgian level, so at the level of the Belgian region, uh, the fact of being able to credit in some way this new tax, which would imply that uh, at the end uh, you, you would discriminate against non-national, at least impose them a tax burden that the, the, the resident would not, would not feel. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's again this discussion about uh, the spirit and, and, and the wording. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe that uh, we should consider that for this purpose um, member states should be able to shift the tax burden from one tax to another without automatically considering that this shifting is constituting a discrimination because the, 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 the German government is fully allowed to shift the tax burden from a tax to another. Uh, if, if, it, if it does that precisely at the moment that it introduces a new tax and that this tax is broader, we should look at the justification of the, this tax, but it, it, I don't think it's shocking uh, to ask non-residents to pay for German uh, highways. Uh, so there is also a justification to oppose tax on non-residents, and uh, since uh, uh, German residents already pay for these highways through another tax, I, d I don't think it's, it, it should be a problem. Um, then, um, as, as Klaus Staringer asked me, uh, to, 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 yes, I think also. Uh, my thinking does not come out of the blue. Uh, most of the arguments that I developed, uh, I found them at least so in filigran uh, in the, the, the actual case law of the court. So some of the arguments are, are already present. Uh, my concern is that uh, they've already always been rejected in quite a strong way, and uh, especially in the last case, uh, because this argument <coughs> that there should be a link between the fact that you can tax the income and the fact of granting a tax advantage, this, this argument has been developed by the court itself in, in a previous case law, which is uh, the Austrian case law, the, the, the Jobra case, and uh, my impression before the Argenta case is that in this particular case, 
the court would accept the justification it had put forward itself in another, in a previous case law, but that didn't happen. So I've almost the impression that these arguments are quite rhetorical, but that the court is not really willing to, to, to make uh, use of, of them, at least not in the tax area, although I hope that I'm, I'm wrong. And, um, and uh, about uh, the uh, Michael Lang um, observations, um, I don't think that the member states should have a lot of room in defining their own economic policies. Uh, it's not that I don't think they don't have a lot of room anymore, so uh, uh, this should apply to taxation also. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the European Commission should uh, try to push forward the harmonization of uh, economic policy, including the use of tax, of tax instrument. But um, although I, I share your opinion concerning economic policy, I'm more uh, concerned about what I call social and non-economic policy. And I know, I know it's difficult to draw a clear distinction between uh, the two, but I wouldn't put everything into the internal market or into the EU objective because it's not like this. And there, I don't even think there's no need to harmonize all the areas. And um, uh, since there's no need to harmonize all the areas of competence of the member states, maybe in this area we should give them more leeway to adopt, uh, to use the tax instrument if they want to, because in some times it could be, it could be useful. Uh, Belgium and, and Austria have um, shared the same problem at the, uh, for uh, higher education, which is not a tax problem, it's a similar problem that uh, we uh, are very welcoming lands and uh, we like uh, to welcome uh, students from uh, bigger countries that do not have the same possibility to access higher education. Uh, in this case, this is a clear spillover effect that of more restrictive policies adopted by other member states to reduce the access to higher education, although it should be an objective at the European level, but at the moment, uh, since the court has ruled on this aspect, doesn't seem to be a, a consensus at the European level, except, which is the indirect effect, to force more welcoming, more welcoming member states to adopt more restrictive policies. So I think we should also take that uh, into uh, consideration when it's come to granting more power to the European Union. Uh, I, I believe in a European federalism, but federalism is also made of clear boundaries between the competence of each, each, each level. And I have the, the impression that in some areas the, the, the court is in, interpreting um, the EU law is encroaching a bit too much in the, in the competences of the member states. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I know that uh, in this room uh, tonight there are a lot of people who would have a lot to contribute uh, to that uh, topic. Uh, however, I suggest that we continue our discussion in a more informal uh, setting uh, afterwards. Uh, but before I uh, want uh, to have a glass of wine with uh, Eduardo and invite all of you uh, to have a glass uh, with him. I first of all would like uh, to uh, thank him for his... I'll be drunk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, at the end he might be drunken, that's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, so before he's drunken, I'd like to thank him for the lecture, but not only for the wonderful lecture, but also, as I've mentioned in the beginning, for just being with us and uh, supporting us, uh, uh, teaching here at our university, doing research uh, with us. Uh, I think this is uh, great uh, for us. Uh, we uh, really appreciate it, and the whole research uh, team and all the students benefit a lot uh, from uh, what Eduardo is doing. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, but before I close, so I w I'd ask uh, Fritz uh, to close our discussion so he should have the last word before we uh, continue our informal dis our discussions in a more informal setting, as I've indicated. Right, so I'm not going to have a long comment. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that Eduardo and all of us, we 
do not get just drunk from the wine, so there's also some food outside. <laughs> and, so we can uh, have even two glasses with it. You can <laughs> have two glasses, and I would like to invite you to have uh, uh, this food and the small buffet with us outside. Thank you very much. Mm.